Thank you all for being here. Um, so this is the book that he's referring to, and there's copies over there. I'm also happy to sign later. Um, so just as as she said, I um, ran, I started and ran kind of the main alliance in the U.S. on local foods and access to healthy foods, and really helped build the food movement uh, in the U.S. and connecting farmers and consumers and people working in low-income communities. Did a lot of work. Um, at, at national policy level, uh, got various pieces of legislation through that gave money to low-income communities, to community groups working in those communities on projects that built that built self-reliance and that connect uh, farmers and consumers, uh, like farm to school programs. And during that time period, I was really kind of engaged with um, trying to get get anti-hunger community, which I'll explain in a little bit, more involved in thinking about where the quality of the food is, the quality of the food and where the food is coming from and more focused on a prevention approach rather than just giving out food as a solution. And got a, you know, ran into a lot of success and ran into a lot of failures, especially at the national level. And ran into a lot of, you know, towards the end, of, I left that organization in 2011 and towards the end of my tenure there, I got you know, kind of frustrated uh, by growing income inequality, by growing uh, connections between big corporations and anti-hunger groups and seeing that, you know, they were selling out essentially. Um, so, I, after I left my job, I decided I could say things that I couldn't say before, so I decided to, to write kind of an expose of it and talk about what an alternative vision would be. And so that's, that, that, that is what uh, the book is, and it took me a lot, lot longer to do it than I thought I would. So, you know, so, you know, in some ways I'm really trying to, you know, challenge neoliberalism and challenge the res our response to hunger, and whether corporations play a positive or self-serving role. And, you know, 
obviously what I'm doing, what I, what I focus on is the US, and so kind of the question is why did I bother to come across the pond? Um, it's because I really wanted a British holiday in November. <laughs> uh, but you know, the weather's about the same at home. But you know, but th I think the US has been exporting a bad model. And you know, my books, real, I, I feel, is like a warning sign for what has gone horribly wrong. And I'm looking, you know, I'm looking for inspiration in some ways to bring back to the US. And I was just up in Scotland, I think I found it. Uh, but I, I also really want to, you know, corporations move capital and, and expertise across borders. And you know, I believe we really need to build strong international movements to resist what I call the hunger industrial complex. So I'm gonna, you know, I, I'm gonna talk to you about the U.S. I don't want you to kind of necessarily extrapolate with it. what I'm talking about. The U.S. applies in the U.K. Uh, because I'm sure some parts do and some parts don't. But you know, my expertise is is back home. So I really, again, I'm, I am gonna focus on that. Um, so let me tell you, kind of start with a story first. I'll start with like, actually a couple of quotes, which I thought I found up there. Okay, so this is my son. His name's Orion. Uh, and when he was in third grade, so about, so about six years ago, he's in ninth grade now, and he's got a little mustache, and he's got a deep voice, and he can't stop looking at his cell phone. Uh, but when Orion was in third grade, he came home, like he was just super excited, it was right before Christmas, and he's like, Mom, Dad, there's a food drive in my class, and, my, and the class that raises the most food and gets the, heavy, the most money and the heaviest food gets a pizza party. And so, you know, he really wanted that pizza party. Uh, so he starts going through a cupboard trying to figure out what the heaviest food is. And so, you know, we help him, we give him a few cans to take, and he goes off to school and he's happy. And so then a week or so goes by, and I'm on my way out to the grocery store, and Orion's like, Dad, Dad, you gotta get me some heavy food. You know, the bin's not full and the deadline's tomorrow. So I'm like, okay, Ryan, I'll look for some heavy food for you. So I'm at the store, I'm thinking what's heavy, and I'm going, you know, I could get him a two liter bottle of Pepsi. Uh, that's cheap and it's heavy. I'm trying to figure out the dollar per pound ratio. And I end up getting him some cans of beans, you know, uh, that were on sale. But I think the, the, before I get going, before I kind of get on with it, um, the, I, oh, I should say that Orion, there was a happy ending for Orion. He did get his pizza party. Um, not because they raised, not because they, you know, collected the heaviest food, but because somebody, uh, some parent in his classroom, from his classroom, wrote a big fat check. Uh, so they raised the most money. Uh, but you know, as I was shopping, uh, as I was sitting there shopping, I realized that there's something about Orion's food drive that was really bugging me. And it's the same problem that I find with food banks in general. And that's that they measure their success, they measure their effectiveness in terms of the amount of pounds that they distribute and the number of people that they serve. Um, so, and they have to increase them every year. It's not kind of like a corporate growth model. The more, you know, this year they have to do 5% more than they did last year in order to appear successful, in order to kind of feel like that they're, they're, they're um, convincing their donors and, their, and the public that they're, they're doing the right thing. And, you know, on some level, that, that, that effect, that, that growth is really not a success, but it's a failure. It's a sign of the failure of our inability to prevent poverty in the first place and inability to prevent food insecurity in the first place. But you know, pounds distributed and people served are, are, not out, are not outcome measures, they're outputs, right? They don't measure impact. Um, and that confusion really cuts to the very problem of the emergency food system. And food is the solution to hunger uh, only in the most illusory of ways, only in the most temporary of ways. Um, you know, just giving away a bag of food today it may solve today's hunger, but it doesn't address the underlying causes that led people to be in that unfortunate situation. And when we don't link that, that immediate solution to strategies that address underlying causes, we're just perpetuating the problem. We're just kicking the can down the road. Uh, so, you know, hunger is a symptom of poverty, which in and of itself is, is linked to a lack of political power. You know, among other causes, racism, sexism, an inadequate educational system, ultimately capitalism are to blame. And a box of free food is a measly substitute for political power. Uh, so, uh, you know, in the United States, food charity has been growing by leaps and bounds since the early 1980s. Uh, the first, uh, you know, at that point in the early 80s, we had a very deep recession. Uh, there was cutbacks in social welfare programs under, under President Reagan. There was high unemployment. I grew up in, um, in a place called Youngstown, Ohio, which is kind of halfway between New York and Chicago. It was kind of the epicenter of the steel industry. Uh, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, uh, Youngstown were all kind of major steel producing towns. Um, and it went south uh, ar around that time. Um, the jobs dried up, steel mills closed down, 
Uh, you saw that um, a lot of the jobs, you know, where the, the, the steel industry was being hurt by Japanese imports. A lot of the jobs went to the southern part of the, of the country, where, which wasn't unionized, which, with, which had the ability to, um, they weren't closed shops. Uh, they were open shop, open shop states. Um, so what, so that my time became a ghost town. It became, you know, what, be, what became what now, now, now known as one of the most miserable cities in the United States. Uh, it lost about 60% of its population. Um, so what happened at that point was that um, churches, labor unions, civic associations started to organize responses to that, that emergency, that kind of social emergency. And they started to give out free food. And it was called, you know, the, the emergency food system because people thought of it as a temporary thing, that they were going to be doing this for a few years to get themselves over the hump. But, you know, they weren't, they weren't thinking of it that, you know, 35 years later we'd be still doing the same thing. And it was, you know, it was a response to a neoliberal agenda uh, that reinforced that, that austerity approach. So let me, I just want to you know, explain to you a little bit about how our structure works, because it's quite different from what, from what I can tell from, from the British structure. Um, Feeding America, this is, a, this is a slide from Feeding America, which is kind of the hub, kind of a trade association of food banks in the country. And the, kind of this explains how they work. Um, so, um, you know, food, the way it can, it, it's different. There's, you know, there's 200 food banks in the country, and those are kind of aggregation points. Uh, they're in different cities, they're in different states around the country. Those are aggregation points for surplus food to come through, kind of like a fair share model from what I can tell. Uh, so food comes in from the supermarket industry, from food processors, et cetera, et cetera. Then the, each of those food banks serves a network of food pantries, which, which I think would be the equivalent of your food banks, kind of at the retail level, where individuals can come in and get free food. Uh, there's about 60,000 of those across the country. And they serve 46 million people, about uh, $5 billion worth of food in, in the past year, or four, four billion meals, I think is the metric that they use. So where does the food come from? Uh, so about 20% 20, 20 of it is bought by the US Department of Agriculture. It's commodities that are bought to, to support the agricultural <laughs> industry and also to distribute to schools and, and other social agencies. Uh, the rest is coming from post-supermarket uh, post or food processor waste. Uh, there's some recovery from produce terminals, uh, some coming out of farms. Uh, increasingly, food banks are, are purchasing more and more of their product because the supermarket industry and the processors are getting much smarter about reducing food waste. So that, that, that source has been drying up. There's a little bit of coming uh, prepared food recovery, you know, at a, for example, at a, at a hotel or a catering event where there's extra, extra food, but a very small amount is coming from, from food drops. Um, so Feeding America, which is that, that hub that I talked to, also procures food nationally. So they have relationships with the big manufacturers. They get food, they get, the, they get truckloads and truckloads of food, and they put that out to bid. So a food bank can bid on whether it wants that food based upon a certain amount of credits that it has. And then uh, they have trucking facilities, trucking resources that will get that food to that food bank somewhere across the country. So it varies, it varies dramatically, uh, depending upon where you are. In California, for example, one half to two thirds of the products that is going through the food banks is produce, because California is such an enormous produce producing state. Uh, so it's stuff that's surplus from the packing houses that doesn't meet cosmetic codes, uh, or it's too small or, 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 or blemished. So it's going into, into food banks rather than getting composted or perhaps getting turned into, into you know, some kind of processed product like juice, for example. Um, so, you know, they're, they're very complex infrastructures. They have huge warehouses, which are the size of, of, of big box stores, very sophisticated, uh, very, very sophisticated businesses. Um, the pantries at the local level, the retail level, vary dramatically also in size and scope. You know, there could be a church closet, there could be a multi-million million dollar agency. I like to talk about the Boston Food Bank, uh, which is one of the kind of more traditional Food banks, it has an enormous warehouse, 117,000 square feet, which is the size of the biggest box stores around. Uh, it has two-story tall fridges. It has a forklift that is uh, a freezer that's fork, like you can drive a fork thrift through. It was built in 2009. It costs $35 million. It has as, as sophisticated a software system, storage uh, system as any grocery, as any uh, wholesaler in the country. It, Distributed 54 million pounds in 2015. Uh, its cash budget is about $20 million and about, again, $54 million worth of food. 
uh, its CEO it, uh, received a salary in 2016 of $350,000, of which $90,000 was an incentive because she met her poundage goals. And then we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so it's a business, and they very much pride themselves on it being, being a business. They see themselves at, at, at the, at, as a peer of, of the grocery industry, and that, that is a, a point of pride for them. But it's not, food banks in the U.S. are not just private sector. Uh, they're very much a public-private um, public partnership. Uh, you, as I mentioned before, USDA buys commodities from farmers. Uh, in 2015, that was about $679 million. Um, we provide tax credits for food donations. So if a company is going to donate uh, you know, a caseload of or a pallet and full load of whatever it will be, um, they get a tax credit halfway between wholesale and retail, which turns out to be about 200, averages about $200 million a year. And then there's 37 states that provide similar tax credits or the earmark support. Some states like Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, you know, provide 10 to 10, 20, 10, 15, 25 million dollars a year in, uh, in support to food banks for them to purchase food. So again, it is a, again, it is not solely a private sector enterprise. Um, so why does this sector grow? You know, why, why does it keep growing? Um, and it grows by popular demand. Um, and I think that popular demand is the volunteers, it's the donors who feel good about solving hunger, it's the, ta it's the companies get that, ta that tax right off, they get the positive publicity, the halo effect uh, from their donations, and, it, and it's also the right wing who points to it as a rationale for privatizing our, our national anti-hunger response. Uh, it, it's growing because entrenched interest profit from it, uh, not because it helps the poor. Uh, it and it also grows because there's waste in the system. We have a very strong ethic against food waste in the United States. And I talk about food banks as being at the intersection of waste and want. Uh, as long as there's waste in the system, and I've been told this by food bankers, as long as there's waste in the system, you know, even if a food bank went out of business, somebody else would pop up because we feel that, that, that wasting that food is immoral. Um, so this is, I just pulled together really quickly a kind of a fun little slide. I mean, there is, you know, it's constant food drives, constant efforts at, at, at the community level in every possible sector to, to, to address hunger. And this is just a kind of a quick slice of what I could find in, you know, just Googling this really quickly last night. Um, so the point here is that the emergency food system, food banks, have become institutionalized. Um, they're, a, they're, they're a seemingly permanent part of American society. They're linked to every civic association, every school, every workplace, every sporting event. And on some level, that's wonderful. On some level, it's really a testament to the, the generosity of people in the United States. But on another level, you know, you have to question, is this a good thing? We've been doing this for 35 years. Are we stuck in a rut? You know, why do we keep the same strategies going for, for 40 years? And it, we're kind of in this relief mode when we should be in a development mode. Uh, there's a great book called Toxic Charity uh, by a gentleman named Robert Lupton who writes about that very issue, about when you keep doing relief uh, and when you should be doing development work, you get stuck, stuck in toxic charity. And I want to give you an, uh, kind of a, a story of how that played out in my own personal experience. So I had never volunteered at a food pantry before I wrote this book. Um, so I decided I really wanted to do that. It was the right thing to do. So I called up my friends. I lived in Portland, Oregon. I called my friends in, at the Oregon Food Bank, which is a fantastic group. And I said, where should I volunteer? You know, I live in Northeast Portland. Where should I go? So they pointed me to what they said was one of the better food pantries in the, in the, in the city. Uh, it's in the basement of a church. It's what's called a shopping pantry. Uh, so it is um, not just you get a box of food. It's you go in, it's laid out like a, half, the, half the basement of the church is laid out like a grocery store. And it's got coolers, it's got shelves, and the food is there, you know, that you can take from based upon your household size and what's available. So as a volunteer, so I decided to volunteer. My first day I go in, I get an orientation from this teenage girl, and she tells me that my role is to be a cross between a personal shopper because I've got to help people navigate the system, and a security guard. So make sure people don't take too much of any one item, especially like the meat, because it's higher value, right? So I got it. I got my instructions in my head. And um, so I, I do my, start doing my shift. It's a four-hour shift. I'm about halfway through, and I come upon uh, my next set of clients, and they're an elderly African-American couple. So, you know, they've been sitting there for two hours and they're looking tired and dejected. And so, I, you know, I go up there, I grab a shopping cart, I throw some boxes in it, 
I introduce myself and I ask them how big their household is and they tell me and I start taking them through the layout of the grocery, of the grocery store slash pantry, right? Um, so I start to tell them, well, you know, you can take a can of tuna, three cans of beans, a uh, thing of spaghetti and six potatoes. So as they're choosing what they want, I realize I'm hovering over their shopping cart. I'm like, making sure they don't take too much because I got these instructions in my head. And I catch myself and I go, this is stupid. Why am I doing this? And so I get, take a couple steps back and give them some space. And I realize that I'm still hovering over their shopping cart, making sure they don't take a few extra darn potatoes. And at that point, you know, I really realize that there's something, there's an inherent power dynamic in, in this food pantry, in the system. I'm a white, middle-class guy. Uh, you know, I've lived a fairly privileged life, and I'm sitting there watching, making sure that this couple who's just down on their luck is not going to take a few extra potatoes. And it just, it felt, it felt oppressive. It felt like I was just recreating these centuries of oppression. And it's not the only time that that kind of thing happened. I was, you know, constantly encouraged by the volunteers, by the staff, to watch out for people. You know, watch out for Mary. You know, she steals stuff. So Mary comes in, tussling with Mary to put stuff back in, on the shelves that she's taking. And, you know, it, it was, it was, it was a, a thoroughly unpleasant experience. Um, so after I did my stint there, um, I decided that I really needed to be on the other end of the, of the, of the, of the experience. Um, so I called up my friends at Oregon Food Bank and I said, where should I go? I want to be a client. And um, so they told me, they sent me to another church on the other side of town. And, you know, I should say I didn't meet the income guidelines. Um, because uh, there's specific, if you get money, if you get food from USDA, you have to have specific, uh, you have to meet a specific guidelines of like under 200% of poverty, roughly, uh, which I didn't. Um, so I go, I go to this church, I'm waiting in the parking lot for the doors to open, and I run into somebody I know. And I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ. And it's this guy I know, Charles. Uh, he, we were on the Food Policy Council together. And Charles lives in the neighborhood. He, um, you know, kind of has a big mouth, to be honest. Um, but, you know, I didn't want him to come up to me and go, hey, Andy, what are you doing here? You're researching a book, right? And I'm going, uh, you know, because I felt like I was going undercover. So I told, I, I, I saw Charles, I said, come here, come here, come here, come here. I want to talk to you. So I pulled him over to the side of the building. And before I could even say anything, um, Charles was like, hey, Andy, don't worry about it. You know, sometimes I need food, too. And, you know, I had some people living in my house and they ate me out of house and home. And, you know, it's okay. You know, it's okay to need a little help. So I wasn't thinking about that. I was just thinking about not getting busted. And so, you know, I think what the point here is that, you know, there's an inherent stigma in, in relying on the food pantry uh, that, um, that Charles was trying to calm down that fear. He was trying to calm, allay that stigma for me. Um, so I want to show you, uh, if I can get this to work, I want to show you a 30-second um, PSA that Feeding America produced that I think reinforces this, this dynamic. Every day across America, excess food is gathered by a network of good people at local food banks, giving hope to millions of children who struggle with hunger. They've earned their wings, and you can too. Together, we can solve child hunger. Support Feeding America and your local food bank at feedingamerica.org. Okay, so what did, get, what did folks notice out of that PSA? Anything strike you as odd? Besides the whole thing? It's good to see angels waiting around. It's good to know there's an angel or two around. Right, there are, yes. But they, did you notice who the angels were and weren't? Absolutely. She was a very nice, attractive young woman with honey and everything. They're white. Right, they're white. The, 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 the volunteers were the ones that had wings, but the clients didn't, right? So kind of reinforces that dichotomy between the deserving poor, or reinforces the whole thing about the undeserving poor. So this is Robert Egger, who's a fantastic social entre entrepreneur. He's in Los Angeles now, uh, doing some great work with um, kind of a community kitchen program. I think this quote of his kind of very much embodies that, that, that video. So, you know, I, this, would be, this would be one thing to give up our dignity if, 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 we're, if it was effective at reducing food insecurity. You know, it would be a price to pay, right? 
but it hasn't been. You know, even with uh, the SNAP program, which is the food stamp program, uh, which I, I, if people don't know what it is, I'm happy to talk about it. But you know, even with that, we haven't been able to reduce food insecurity in the United States. Um, USDA, the Department of Agriculture, again, measures food insecurity through an 18 question survey that's handed out through the Census Bureau. Uh, there's like 60,000 people. They do it every year. They started in 1995. Uh, and they, you know, in 1995, food insecurity, the green line was at 12%. Very low food security was at 4%. The numbers up and go up and down according to the economy. You know, we, we had a big recession in 07, so the numbers went up. And they're slowly coming back down. But overall, over this course of this 20-year period, this we have not reduced food insecurity. We're still at the same level as it was, uh, a little bit even worse than it was 20 years ago. So this is not what I call progress. You know, this is what I call treading water or stagnation. So the question is, why, why are we stagnating? Uh, and you know, minimum wage, and one of the main reasons, if you talk to economists in the US, they'll tell you that the minimum, one of the main reasons for stagnation is wages. The minimum wage hit its highest level in terms of purchasing power in 1968. And it would be at over $18 an hour if it kept up with productivity. Uh, at the federal level, it's now seven and a quarter an hour, and a number of states have higher rates. Uh, and the, again, the federal poverty line for a family of two is about $9.75 an hour if they worked full time. So what you see is that about 60% of the people that are, that are receiving food stamps and a similar percentage of people are going to food banks are wage earners. It's not the, it's not the, the lazy gadabouts. It's not the folks who are disabled or elderly. I mean, there is that. But you know, the, the folks who are, who by and large are, are, are coming to food banks or coming to, who are, are getting uh, food stamps are the working poor. They're not getting enough hours. Their wages are too low. But you know, going back to that, going back to that that um, that uh, little graphic about uh, about the food banks and the size of them, you know, you know, you would think that food banks would be working on minimum wage and be working to prevent poverty, but they're not. Uh, there's only a handful or two of those 200 food banks in the country that are advocating for a minimum wage, much less housing or or health care. Uh, they stay in what I call a nutrition safety zone. They advocate on nutrition programs. We have 15 federal nutrition programs. Uh, which are relatively safe. They can avoid controversy that way. They don't alienate their corporate donors. They don't alienate their board members. Uh, this is Gloria McAdams. She used to run a food bank in, in Connecticut. And I think her, 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 her words here are very, you know, uh, would be well echoed uh, with other food bankers around the country. So I started asking my friends, you know, well, you guys know, you know, a lot of, I have a lot of friends in the food banking world and they're fairly progressive. I go, well, why aren't you guys working on wages? Well, you know that that's a key driver to hunger. And what they tell me, one of the reasons, many issues, but one of the reasons that they tell me is because our boards won't let us. You know, our boards are from the grocery industry. They're from companies that are sensitive to labor price increases. You know, increasing the minimum wage is gonna harm their profits. They go, fine, let's take a look at that, right? Let's see if that's true. So I, I, I grabbed my son, Orion, who's, because he loves looking at the computer. He's really good at doing research with me. And we went through every food bank website. So we found that employment affiliation on 157 of 200 food banks. About 80% of the food banks had employment affiliation data for their, for their board members. Big old spreadsheet, 2,500 board members. Found that 22% of them work for a Fortune 1000 company, one of the 1,000 biggest companies in the US, or a private sector equivalent. Uh, only two work for a labor union, and these are the companies that had the most of the number of, food, of their employees on food bank boards. Uh, very few clients on food bank boards, very little ethnic and racial diversity as well. Uh, so then I also started figuring out, well, what, there's no incentives on this level, maybe there's incentives on salaries. And I don't know if I put this slide in here or not, no I didn't. So I started to look at, uh, you know, what are the salaries of food bank CEOs? And I found that most of them were, were kind of over $200,000 or more. There's a you know, number that were getting up $300,000, $500,000 a year. And in some cases, they're getting bonuses for distributing more and more food. So the point here, the point here is that food banking has become big business and big business profits from, from anti-hunger efforts. And let me give you kind of a really good example on how that plays out. Walmart, I guess, is ASDA here, right? Uh, so, I'm going to use Walmart because it fits better in my head. Uh, so Walmart has a big PR problem in the United States because it's taken the low road to profitability. It pays very poor wages. Uh, it's only recently increased them to 9 to $10 an hour, uh, which is a little bit better than minimum. Uh, but it's been kept out of major metropolitan areas because of those practices. 
Washington, Boston, Chicago, LA, Seattle, list goes on and on. Uh, it's been kept out of those areas by and large. Uh, uh, Labor is very strong in those places and, and stopping them from coming in. So what does Walmart do? It starts to pump money into its philanthropic arm, into Walmart Foundation. In 2010, it made a commitment of $2 billion to anti-hunger groups uh, for, in terms of food and cash. Um, and most of that food is stuff they'd be dumping anyways to get a tax rate for. So they more than exceeded that, that, uh, that amount. As you can see, these are the three, three of the largest anti-hunger groups in the country, and this is the amount of money they pulled in from Walmart during that time period. You know, which is great. You know, you know, on some level, I know all these folks, and it's like, you know, God bless them. God bless us paying their salaries and their, and their staff. But I'm not, you know, certainly the Walton family doesn't need any more money. They, they've got tens and tens of billions, right? Uh, but on another level, Walmart is gaming the system. So what they do is they pay their workers sub-living wages. They encourage their workers to uh, go to food banks. They actually, you know, uh, in some cases, they've organized food banks within their stores. They encourage them to get onto food stamps so they can make ends meet. A congressional study found that uh, Walmart's pra labor practices were costing taxpayers over $6 billion a year in, in public benefits. Uh, then Walmart is the single largest redeemer of food stamps in the country. It redeemed 18% uh, of food stamps or $13 billion in 2014. So again, it's paying its workers too little, encouraging them to get in food stamps, and then taking the, the money from them and making profits off of it. Um, it also is getting huge amounts of earned media and publicity from, from its donations, and it uses its donations strategically to enter into those markets from which it's been shut out. Um, so, you know, on some level, I expect this from Walmart. Um, they're, they're very savvy uh, and they're very strategic. But what I don't expect and where I have higher expectations is among the nonprofit non groups. And what you see is you don't, you don't see anti-hunger groups, you don't see the food banks speaking out against Walmart's labor practices, speaking out for higher wages, walking the picket lines with the workers on, on Black Fridays and the day after Thanksgiving uh, when shopping's highest. Um, what you don't see, for example, is Washington, D.C. in 2013 passed an ordinance, passed legislation that mandated a minimum wage of $12.50 an hour for big box retail workers, uh, as mainly Walmart, if they wanted to come into the city. City Council passed it, the mayor vetoed it, they couldn't avert the veto, but there are lots of anti-hunger groups in Washington who are getting six and seven figure grants from Walmart and they did not speak out in favor, of the, in favor of that legislation, even though it clearly has implications for the, for the welfare of their constituents. Um, so, you know, what we get instead is, see if I can, is I'm gonna show you a, again, a, it's a 30 second clip that aired in April and May in the States, and it's a cost marketing campaign between Walmart, Feeding America, and a number of these, these companies here. You know, it's one of those things where if you buy a, you know, can of soup, Walmart, uh, Walmart and the company will give a few cents to, to Feed America, excuse me, uh, which added up to about $9 million. So I want you to pay attention to the food that's being, oops, the food that's being distributed in this video. It's being promoted, not distributed. If it will go. What would you do if I sang out of tune? Would you stand up and walk out on? Oh, baby, how do you All right, so what do you guys see? Huge name brands. Any specific products in general? Pop-Tarts. Pop-Tarts. I assume you guys have Pop-Tarts here. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it, you know, it's, 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 it's unhealthy, sugary, processed foods, which we're in the middle of a diabetes and obesity epidemic. Why are we promoting the public to consume those foods when, in just in terms of fundraising? And it's not just here. I mean, I'm not going to. I'm tight on time, but you know, fair share um, did a is doing a promotion currently with Coke, where you can take a picture of your Coke bottle and they send 25p to fair share. So it, it, this type of thing, you know, is, is going on in many different places. 
so it's become, you know, it's become an unholy alliance. It's become a hunger industrial complex, just like the military industrial complex that President Eisenhower talked about you know, 50 odd years ago. There's few incentives to actually seek to end hunger as it would be bad for business on all levels. So, you know, uh, you know, apart from, you know, apart from all of this kind of, apart from the economic justice elements of it and the relationships with corporations, you know, I don't want to leave you gloom and doom. There's a lot of hope. There's a lot of really interesting things happening in the U.S. Uh, and the anti-hunger field is really changing quite rapidly uh, and in some very positive ways. And, um, you know, and some of it's coming from inside and come, some of it's coming from outside. Uh, I just want to tell a few, I want to give you a few examples of that. Uh, farm to school is, is growing rapidly. Uh, now 30% uh, 30 of school kids in the U.S. can access at least one local food item per day uh, through their school cafeterias. Uh, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers is this a kind of a labor-ish uh, ent entity that's putting pressure on fast food service companies and supermarket chains to pay an extra penny per pound uh, for tomatoes and peppers and strawberries grown on the East Coast, and especially in Florida. Um, and what they've done through with that, with that, with that whole process is they've, they've helped to eliminate human trafficking, human slavery that used to exist in the Florida tomato industry. Uh, they're reducing sexual harassment. They're, they're increasing the rights of, of workers. Plus, they're giving them uh, a, a wage bump that's actually almost doubling their salary in many ways. Um, in Canada, uh, there's a, something called Freedom 90, which is a union of food pantry volunteers. These are the little church ladies who are volunteering at at the food pantry, and they've been doing it for 20 years. They're tired of it. They're like, God, I don't want to do this anymore. But you know, they feel like they have to because they're committed to their community, and they feel like the province of Ontario isn't putting enough money into social assistance programs. Um, so they've called upon them to, you know, to do so, so to make food banking obsolete. And um, you know, because they're a union, they have demands, and their demands are mandatory retirement by the age of 90, hence Freedom 90, uh, lay us off, mandatory layoffs, Freeze our salaries or, or double them because we don't care because we're unpaid volunteers. So, but you know, and they're real people. They're like again, they're the the the, they're the folks that politicians listen to. Um, but and we're also seeing some really positive changes in in, in food banking. Uh, one great example is Foodlink up in Rochester, New York, which is up in an apple growing area. The schools weren't buying apples from New York State; they're importing them from the other side of the country. So they started uh, buying apples from local farmers cutting them up, selling them to the schools. They've done millions of pounds of apples and they're using the profits to, well, they're supporting the local economy. And they're using the profits to, for their catering business as well, uh, in which they do job training. So they're, they're doing this kind of holistic approach of using the resources of the food bank for economic and community development. Uh, and there's lots of other great examples that are going on with food banks are kicking the soda out, they're, um, uh, they're you know, starting to measure their, their impacts in terms of health, they're changing their valuation metrics, they're working on minimum wage and affordable housing. There's a, there's a lot of great stuff that's happening kind of sporadically across the across country. Yeah, if people have proper wages and benefits when they needed them, when they were sick, they could make their own choices. I think food banks are basically the response of the middle classes to this awful situation that's happening to other people, certainly in this country, and, and I've been to America and I can't say it's any different, you know, while the middle classes are still having fun and enjoying their life, they'll, they'll deign to come out to the food banks and, and help out, but that's not, yeah, nobody wants food banks, nobody should need them, but it, the real problem here is that people, there are proper jobs and proper benefits for people who are, are too sick mentally and physically to do jobs. And this is just to my mind. I would okay. agree. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to finish and I'll transfer. I think we have time for Q&A. Mm -hmm. OK. So you know, I, I think we need to take back anti-hunger work. You know, We need to take Occupy. We need to Occupy, take it back from corporations uh, who are using their effort, their meager money, to bolster their images and are perpetuating the problem. Uh, we need to hold food banks and other corporate partners accountable for the damage they're doing to our public health, to human dignity, and our collective ability to actually solve hunger and not just perpetuate the problems. And we can't be tinkering around the edges anymore. Uh, so, you know, there's some very real and entrenched interests that, are benefit, that benefit from maintaining the current system. 
uh, we need to try to overcome them. Um, and the time has come that we call it the truth to say that the charitable food sector is not solving the problem of hunger. And we can't pretend to be solving hunger day by day, meal by meal, without including systematic, without addressing the systemic issues of it. We're just keeping people disempowered, we're just keeping them impoverished, and we're just disregarding their potential to be an incredibly powerful force for, for, force for social, social change. I, you know, I, in the US, I don't say we need to shut down food banks because there's a huge need for them. Uh, we, but I do say that food banks need to create a long-term strategic plan uh, to get themselves out of a system that, um, that they never should have been in. in the, well, that they should have been a short-term short -term answer. And we need a vision for doing things differently. Uh, so we need to start viewing growth in a negative light. Expansion should be seen as a measure of failure. We need to create a moratorium on building new buildings, like the one in Boston. You know, it's like not building any more infrastructure for the fossil fuel industry. Uh, they need to start putting more money into policy advoca advocacy and organizing the poor. Um, you know, we need to be putting the impoverished into leadership positions. I was just in Edinburgh and talking to folks in the, the Scottish Poverty Truth Commission, and I found that to be quite inspirational. Uh, and, you know, we need to be thinking again about people first and waste second. So I'm going to leave it at that, and thank you. Um, we have got a little bit of time before we hear Hannah's talk for a couple of direct questions to Andy. And I, and I take your point, and you know, sometimes we think about jobs as, as the solution, but in an age where there's not full employment, what, what other solutions might we have in terms of basic incomes, etc.? Um, and Hannah's going to talk about the specifically kind of UK based changes. Um, through which you know, the food banking system has, has emerged. Um, and you know, at the end, we can sort of try and bring this together and think about what we can learn um, in terms of warnings, as well as kind of positive lessons that we might learn from across the pond. Um, so if there are a couple of direct questions to Andy Stott, we are, by the way, um, I meant to say that with filming, if anyone's uncomfortable about being filmed, let us know at the end. Um, but it would be quite useful to hear if you're happy to share where you're from um, before giving a question. That would that would be useful. Um, so, do we have any particular questions at this point? Uh, Chris Aldridge, Manchester Friends of the Earth. Um, clearly, there's a lot of subsidy going on. Is, is this sort of across all the food sectors in the same way, as, as far as you're aware? Because um, it, 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 it's, it's not just the, the low wages; it's the fact that that yeah, these companies are effectively getting paid for, for doing this, aren't they? The money they receive. Right. Are there a lot of subsidies all across the, the food is sector? It, is it even across the, the sectors of, of food, or is it there? I mean, there's, you know, certainly the, the, they're getting subsidies for donating their food. They're getting a tax credit, right? Um, and they're getting non governmental subsidies in terms of media attention. Um, you know, there's you know the United States has strong subsidy programs in terms of in terms of its big commodity crops like corn and soy and wheat, rice and peanuts, uh, and those are all things that you know that do help to drive down the, the, the cost of food. It has, you know, it, I, don't, I wouldn't call them subsidies, but it has a, a structure of agriculture that is um, monopsonistic in the sense of that it has very few purchasers for the product. So you'll see. You know, four firms control 70% of the livestock production. Four firms control 50% you know, of pork. I don't know the exact numbers. I'm just going to keep, you know, just by, uh, by example. And that concentration, that lack of enforcement of antitrust provisions, <coughs> ensures that uh, food does make me keep uh, relatively affordable as well. I think, you know, the one thing that I keep coming back to and thinking about food waste, and I keep talking to, to folks and going, you know, what, just, just, a, just an anecdote. There's a lot of sheet cake, you know, birthday cakes in the system, uh, in the food banking system. And what people tell me is that stores like Walmart, you know, when they have customers coming in wanting a sheet cake, they don't want to just have one, they want to have 10, so people have a choice. And it's a lot easier for them to bake 10 and throw the nine out that they don't sell uh, because the food is so cheap to, to produce, both in terms of labor because they don't pay their workers well, and both in terms of raw products. So 
it, and in some ways, the, the inherent cheapness of food is, is definitely a driving force in, in food waste. What do you comment on perhaps another American connection which I've been written about? And I don't know exactly, probably 50 to 75 percent of people that go to food banks are facing the impact of welfare benefit cuts based to various welfare benefit entitlements. And one of the reasons I suggest for that is over the last 10 years, Britain's adopted in different ways a medal of assessing people for entitlements based on health insurance models used by American companies, in my opinion. Um, and I just wonder if there's a, there's a link here beyond just the food business, but broader businesses, broader financial sectors, consumer finance so, in corporate America, of which corporate Britain is part of it. Yeah, I, you know, there's, uh, in, in looking at who supports food banks, it's not just the, it's not just the food sector. It's virtually every sector in the, in, in the American economy. Uh, the ones that tend to be more generous in this arena are ones that are more outward facing to consumers uh, because, you know, it motivates their employees because they want to, you know, it's something that, that people respond to well. Uh, so you don't see tech companies, for example, or you don't see business to business companies do it, giving money out for that. But you do see a lot of the financial industry, a lot of financial services, a lot of, um, uh, I don't know, uh, motor companies, um, airlines, and you know, folks, again, that, that have a, a consumer outward facing presence. Um, so, and they're doing it because it's easy. I, I, my, my take is that you know, they're, it, it, it's a topic that is not controversial that makes them look good, makes them feel good. And you know, no one's going to argue with fighting against childhood hunger. Uh, it's it's get, got great photo opportunities, great optics. You know, it's and it's not going to threaten their profits. Yes. And I'm Mike Adams from Salford University. Um, you talk about businesses and um, the end hunger charities having this unholy alliance. And um, I wonder how do they respond to that? And you know what, what do they have to say about that? I mean, I think there's you know there's a real problem with the global food system itself. If you even set aside hunger, there's a problem with the global food system producing wastefulness, and they've got an outlet for that waste. So there's no incentive to change the food system as it exists at the moment. So how do they respond to that idea that? I think they respond in two ways. Uh, in the charitable, in the charitable food sector, food banks will respond saying, kind of with a platitude of "We're all in this together." That everyone can, should, can, and should be at the table. Corporations can make a difference as well. Um, they don't. They see corporations as an inherent part of a kind of a bipartisan, unilateral, multilateral approach to, to addressing the problem. Kind of a, uh, I'll leave it at that. In the kind of the lobbying sector, in the, in the advocacy sector, the groups that are more focused on federal food programs, to them, uh, corporations are an essential part of their lobbying coalition. So there's, you know, I, what I didn't talk about is their $85 billion worth of federal food programs, and most of that money is being captured by industry. <coughs> so you have lobbying for, and if SNAP, for example, food stamps is in the farm bill. So what you have uh, lobbying on the farm bill for, for, for the food stamp program are the, is the soda industry, uh, Pepsi's a huge player, Kraft, Unilever, I mean all the major food companies are spending millions of dollars lobbying because it's in their own economic interest to protect their sales. For Kraft, one sixth of their sales comes from SNAP. Uh, you know, Walmart is a large percentage. And so the, uh, uh, the entire food in industry is very much tied into this kind of form of tied aid. And the anti-hunger community sees them as partners in, in creating as big a tent as possible to fight back um, rollbacks from the Republican Party. We can save any more questions um, until the end. I think maybe we've sort of come to that point where we realise it's a really, really complex and contradictory problem. Um, and you know, you mentioned the systemic cheapness of food, um, which in the UK was linked to the repeal of the Corn Laws when suddenly the UK markets were open to foreign imports of cheap food and domestic farming decreased. But what I, met, what I noticed visiting um, some American food banks as part of my research um, was this incredible amount of, of fresh produce. 
um, and realising that America or parts of America have a surplus of produce, whereas the UK is importing most of its uh, produce, particularly fruits and vegetables. So we're bringing in lots of fruits and vegetables and we're exporting whiskey and biscuits and fizzy drinks. And so this is another sort of, I guess, Brexit-related question. But we can leave these big complex questions till the end and like look more at the at some kind of local, more local level research. Um, so I'd like to invite Hannah to speak. Hannah um, has recently published a book called Hungry Britain, The Rise of Food Charity in the UK. And I haven't read her book, but I've read her PhD thesis. And it's been an absolute inspiration to me. And Hannah's been involved with most of the research that has been exploring the nature and extent of food poverty in the UK, including a DEFRA funded review of food aid in, in 2013, of which Hannah was lead author. So I'm really grateful for her coming today. Um, so Hannah, thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Hard act to follow after Andy. Um, and much of this I suspect many of you will know um, and be experiencing um, and be involved in on a day-to-day -day basis. So, uh, but hopefully you'll find something interesting in what I've got to say. Um, this is the book that Charlie was just talking about, and it's um, kind of the basis of, of some of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, it's based on, as Charlie said, sort of three, four years of work in this space, uh, looking at the rise of food charity in the UK context. Um, I'm going to talk today, I thought would be most useful, um, given Andy's focus as well, so it's a slightly different different take on things, but to kind of talk through kind of the nature of food insecurity in the UK, what we know about it, um, the current charity response and sort of policy around that and risk policy response as well, and sort of where we might go from here. Um, so in terms of context, we see there's lots of points of difference, which I guess potentially gives us hope <laughs> from the previous presentation. Um, but one of those, I think, um, is the timescales involved too. So whilst um, food charity in various guises isn't particularly new in the UK, there, there are lots of histories of that kind of ad hoc provision. The scale that we've seen, we've seen over the last, 10, um, last 17 years is something that is new. Um, increasingly streamlined, professionalised, over the scale of the whole country. This is a new phenomenon for us and something which I think has been met with uh, a sense of moral outrage and something that we are still grappling with and debating um, amongst ourselves, which I think gives us a great opportunity to kind of think about where we want to be um, and how we might get there. Um, my talk talks a lot more about the role of public policy and, and sits much more on that interface between government and charity. Um, so I hope that's also um, something interesting for you too. So just to sort of start off, I think, one of the most basic things from a kind of, I guess, researcher's perspective, but really importantly, a policy-making perspective, to have good policy, you need to have robust definitions of your policy problem. And I think that is one of the first things that we need to address in the UK context. Hunger, food poverty, food insecurity, I think is one of these, of the range of ideas that people kind of inherently think they understand. And it's a language that's kind of common enough that we can kind of get away with the fact that actually, what exactly, what are the few sentences we're talking about when we're talking about it? And actually when the APPG for Hunger and Food Poverty put their call for evidence out in 2014, they used all three terms in about two paragraphs and said, and actually said in their um, opening, you know, we understand that there's a conceptual question here, but really this is too urgent a problem. We need to just get on and fix it. So I would say, first and foremost, we need to think about what the policy problem is and define it clearly. Thankfully, we can do that. There's lots of standard definitions um, and ones that are then measurable, as Andy said, um, in measures that have been used, particularly in the States and Canada, routinely. We do not measure that data here. We do not measure it systematically on a yearly basis, so I cannot provide you with the equivalent chart that Andy showed you earlier. However, in the last year, there's been big strides in our knowledge in this space, and a couple of big surveys have used these food insecurity measures. Um, and the Food Standards Agency, they have a survey called the Food and Use Survey, and it was actually really significant that in the latest round, they included the food security module within it. And so they did measure, they did a snapshot me measure of levels of food insecurity in their survey. And this found 
that 13% of people were marginally food insecure, which is defined as problems or anxiety about accessing adequate food, and 8% were low or very low, had low or very low food insecurity. So that means they reduced e the, qual the quality of food or they actually reduced their food intake. So I just did a rough kind of compar comparison when Andy put his slides up, but um, they're quite similar. So it was about, was it, was it I couldn't quite 12. 12, yeah, and then five or six, was it, yeah. So we're actually on a par, you know, um, which I think is something that we probably need to think about. Um, so, but as I said, we don't, the government or no one has a routine measure that they do every year, so this will be a snapshot and then hopefully they'll repeat it, but they may not. So we do need better measures. Um, this is some UNICEF data that the Food Foundation put up on their website when, and, and reused, which is particularly powerful because it shows just how high food insecurity levels are amongst households with children. So you probably can't see that here, but um, basically what it found was that in a survey of households where children under the age of 15 live, 19% um, had a respondent who was moderately um, or severely food insecure, and 10.4%, that's the highest proportion in Europe, so that's this second graph, 10.4% um, lived with someone who was fit, severely food insecure. So this is quite a staggering graph um, when we stop to think about it. Um, and it shows us how important it is that we understand this, this problem better and that we are able to produce policy responses which are adequate to address it. So in terms of the charitable emergency um, food response, it's been very significant. And this is just my reworking of Drossel's data into a, into a graph like this um, on Windows, so sorry about that. But this gives you a sense particularly of kind of some of the timescales involved, I think, as well. Um, and over a five-year period from um, using, this is using Drossel's own data, so from 2011 12 uh, the number of parcels their network distributed was um, 128,697 parcels. And then five years later, between 2015 and 16, that went to 1.1 million. So these were a really critical few years. Um, but also, if we drill down on that, you can see that it was something that affected children as well, which is, which is really important, I think. Um, and this is some work that a colleague of mine from Liverpool and I did, again using Trussell's data. Um, and this it is, I think, um, very shocking as well. So between, and it shows the importance of that year when a lot of welfare reform was implemented. So between 2012 and 13 and 13 and 2013-14, Trussell Trust Food Bank provision to children rose by 252% in absolute terms. Since that year, provision to children has risen by a further 69%, but that remains the most critical year of change in provision to children. Um, and obviously this is, this is a focus on food banks because that's mostly what my previous work has, been, has done, but obviously there is, has been a growth of other kind of feeding provisions to children, um, breakfast for provision, and then increasingly we're hearing about holiday hunger as well. Um, so it's, there's lots of different guises. Um, some of you may recognise this still as, as still from the, the Ken Loach film by Daniel Blake, where there's a very powerful food bank scene. Um, and I think what I would one of the key messages for, ta for taking away from my presentation, I think, would be that it's clear that um, the charities, in particularly in the form of food banks, are responding in practice to this um, need in the UK. Um, and they are providing important spaces of care and solidarity in our community, no doubt. However, they are problematic, and many people involved in food bank provision would be the first to tell you so. Um, and I think that we need to explore some of those elements that many people know only too well um, in terms of issues of accessibility um, to food provision, be that physical accessibility, whether there is a food bank near you, or whether that's in terms of being in touch with the right people to get referred, or whether it's open at times that you can get to it. Um, the sustainability of the provision. I mean, uh, Andy's shown us one version, of potentially, of the future, where it's a self-feeding kind of never-ending. Um, but that's not inevitable, and, and on a day-to-day -day project, 
um, on a day-to-day -day level, projects might not, uh, you might struggle. Um, and also, people's entitlements when they're in these systems, they're not rights, um, they're gifts. And so people can't rely on it as a source in an ongoing way. Um, and also, really importantly, um, any measure of definition of food security often has um, social acceptability as a key element to it. Um, and that's something that we need to really remember. And the lady in the audience before did make that, make that point about choosing the food. And shopping is, like it or not, our key, most socially accepted, most common method of obtaining foodstuffs. And so being able to participate in that accepted, taken for granted uh, mode of acquiring food is really important. I think overall, if we look at the timeline and the increasing amount of evidence by other researchers as, as well as my work, particularly the work of Rachel Loopstra, and who's done a lot of work with the Trussell Trust, um, we're seeing the, uh, just a, a profound relationship between changes to entitlements in the form of, um, of welfare and social security and this rise in need for food provision and food crisis. Um, there does seem to be a kind of symbiotic relationship where the state retrenches and this provision rises up to, in an attempt to meet the needs of, of local people. Um, and I think we are at a point now where we need to, and the, the kind of theme of this talk was I think, my title, Whose Responsibility? And it's a question we need to ponder upon, but I think ultimately when we look at what's driving people into food crisis and then wider experiences of food insecurity, upstream structural responses are absolutely critical. And we need that kind of um, a drive um, at the top end as well. I think there are some positive... There have been some really positive interjections in this space in the policy debate over the last three years, definitely. The um, APPG on Hunger and Food Poverty in the Frankfield Chairs, they did their um, inquiry in 2014. They launched uh, an organisation called Feed in Britain, which has funded various projects. And they're still, and Frank and, and his colleagues are still quite a prominent voice in this area. Um, and then we also had the Fabian um, Commission on Food and Poverty, which... Um, a number of people in this room were involved in, which was a really, really powerful, um, I think, evidence collecting um, exercise, which um, actually did include people who were experiencing hunger on it. So I think it would be another source of inspiration for Andy in terms of um, bring, uh, bringing kind of empowering policy making to the fore. Um, and I think to pick up on sort of Andy's last point, the End Hunger UK campaign, we're going to hear a bit about that in a minute, I think, um, actually does have as part of it many food charity organisations, um, including Trussell and Fair Share, and those organisations are involved in that conversation and have been, um, and I think that is particularly important because it is one of the things that I write about at the end of my book about how important it is um, for everybody involved to still have that kind of public voice and try and speak into into policy making. Um, unfortunately, as a policy focused researcher, it's, it's clear that that's not yet translated into a, a kind of systematic response from government. Um, and actually, in fact, particularly the rise of food banks themselves, it, that is, it, it's just incredibly politically contentious. It was used as a hot potato for, for it has been for, for many years and still largely is. Um, and so constructive conversations around these have been difficult, but I have not lost faith that we, we may yet have them. Um, so in terms of where policy... Well, I suppose, actually, I'll get, sorry, I'll put that one at the end. So in terms of policy, where we're at in terms of policy frameworks, I think, unfortunately for us, we ha there's always been a policy void in this space. DEFRA technically have responsibility for household food and security, but... They, and you know they did in the kind of mid 2000s publish a few things which which did get household food insecurity. Liz Dowler and I did some work for them on it in household food insecurity and consumer responses to <coughs> rises around 2010. And so there was this kind of moment where they were there and they funded um, the review that that Charlie mentioned, but it never quite got off the ground. I think in a, in a kind of as a policy agenda there. Um, but just as disappointingly, there are, it, it's a cross white call issue, obviously, and it touches on pretty much every department, whichever way you want to look at it. And so, therefore, there is many an opportunity for government to run with this issue. Um, 
but unfortunately, as it stands, there still hasn't been that. You know, whether you would, whether we would want it from DWP, whether we would want it from the Department for Education Cabinet Office. There's lots of places you could rationalise it being located, but it just hasn't kind of flown. And I think the, the politics around it probably also has a, a large part to play in that. Um, and historically, we haven't had a, a kind of policy framework for it in the States and Canada. They have their measure. It's a, it is a policy kind of issue or, or kind of thing that's monitored, whereas it, it never has been here. Um, so I, I think a lot would probably need to, to change at that level, but it, I don't think it would be hard, really. There just needs to, I guess, be, be that policy drive. So on the basis of, of this kind of work, then, I would argue there's kind of four key things that, that well, I would um, sort of present my evidence to government and say there's kind of four things we need to do. Um, one is just vital that we have a proper definition and proper measurement of food insecurity. Unless we have that, we don't know what we're dealing with or how best to address it. Um, and so I think that's just got to be number one starting point. Um, second, I would argue that we need broad and ambitious policy responses um, as well that focus not just on food crisis but also on vulnerability, experiences of chronic food insecurity um, and you know, very much working on that, focusing on social acceptability, minimum income standards, what's the minimum standard of living we expect and how does food fit into that? There's lots of amazing work done by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, well, funded by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation on minimum income standards and food is integral to all of that. We don't need to do it all again, we just need to harness that evidence and bring it into the policy conversation. Um, but I do think, and it is a narrative we can bring from other scholars in the States as well as Andy, you know, the link between the erosion of social rights and entitlements and the rise and institutionalisation of food charity is a really important issue that um, we need to look a little bit more in the face here, I think, um, and, and in terms of policy too. But I think as well, we do need more inclusive policy making, so I would chime again with Andy on that. Um, and I think the work of CAF and others um, on um, with poverty forums, talking to policy makers is absolutely crucial. You know, I think the good thing with um, the Inhub UK is that you have got the, the frontline providers and responders talking now to government more, um, and that's a great thing. And we need that, and we need um, people that need this provision to be around the table too, and there is great progress on that too. And then the last point is just to continue, um, just to more enthusiastically say how good I think the Edtong UK work is in bringing those organisations around the table to have a voice because I think they've done a really good job um, up, up to this point in trying to um, kind of make those points to policymakers and try and affect change, and I think it's critical that that continues. Um, because they're one of the most powerful, powerful voices for that. So I'll leave that there, and then I think we can keep it Everything. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>